Hi, this is Antti from React Studio. Uh, in this video, I'm going to show you some best practices of how, how to use React Studio. And uh, I, I've gathered this kind of list here, which I'm going to go, go through. So uh, let's start with, the, with the, the basics of the React Studio. Obviously, this is the, the, the project map here. You can change the project map view to uh, so that it shows with the screens and, and uh, components and this is a list version of it but let's use the project map and the app settings you can go to app settings always by clicking the app settings node and here you can change the name of the app and the first launch and set the 404 uh, page and the base format for example if you want to design it uh, for the tablet size and add the copyright which will be generated in the code and the launch images and the well bunch of stuff here and then the in the app styles you can change the the basic styling of the app uh, for example the navbar colors and the text color and the grid unit it's actually important in some some of the uh, measurements here uh, is uh, it's it's done in grid units in the in react studio so you can set that the grid unit is a different in different uh, screen size but by default you can just leave them for example to 10 pixels and the navbar height height uh, this is five grid units and uh, then there's a, the, the base text head, headline action and navbar title fonts that you can change here. Anyway, that's the basic stuff here. And uh, the, 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 the first thing that I, I would like to uh, show you when, when you start designing something is probably that it's wise to start by using the data. So I mean, just create your API endpoints first and figure out what kind of data that you are going to show in, in uh, in the UI and then start designing the UI. It's just easier in the studio to do that way. You can do it, obviously you can do it so that you make the design, but usually you just, it's better if you have some data. So in the data tab, uh, I, would, I would start it so that I will create a data sheet. Uh, let's call this to do, to do's. And I could uh, sh use my Xano account or Firebase or whatever, but I'm going to show this, uh, use this JSON placeholder API. And let's find out how I can I can uh, find the API endpoint here. Yeah, here is the. Let's use the posts, so I can just copy this endpoint here, and uh, fill this. Uh, let's let's call this posts instead of to dos. Posts uh, from the web service. So I'll just click data plugin setup. I can click it also from here, and just use the generic JSON plugin here. I will just add it here and just paste the URL here. And basically I'm good to go. I, I don't need to uh, do anything for this, but uh, for the refresh interval, this is the how often the the UI will uh, fetch the updates from the, from the server. I will change it to 60 seconds. So it will not do it all the time. And then we'll just select the JSON here and it download, downloaded 20 rows. Uh, we don't need any more than 20 rows in the in the design time. And then when you when you actually generate the code, this is important checkbox here. I would always recommend using don't export placeholder data. Basically, if I just now click without this checkbox checked, I will click open in browser. It would generate this code, uh, this data sheet as an array into the code. And in real life, you'll always have this this array will be always fetched from the server. So it doesn't make any sense to actually generate this into code. So I would just click this. So now I have the data for the design time in studio, but I don't, I will, we will not uh, generate it into the code. So I will just check that. And then uh, I could just uh, start designing the post screen or the po posts lists probably. So you could do it in, in many ways, but I will do it so that I'll just drag text element here. I will duplicate it with command D and then I can link this uh, to, the, uh, to the posts uh, columns here. So basically those are props, but I'm not going to do it this, uh, this moment because we're going to create a list. So I will just click command click this one. So both of these labels are selected. Just click, click make list. And then I want to 
select the data sheet for the list. So it will be posts. Now this list already uh, is showing 20 rows for me and I'm going to make it full width. Maybe add a navigation bar for the for the for the list here. And uh, by the by the way, this grid spacer element, it's a as it said, it's just a, it's just a like a oh, sorry element for adding a adding an empty space. And I think it's better to put it in the into the uh, end of the screen here. You don't have to use it, but it, it's a handy handy one to have it have it have it in the screen. So the list is here, and then we need to connect the the list item. This this component was created when I used the create uh, create list, and uh, now we are adding the props. So in the posts, the title uh, connects to this element, and maybe the body will connect to this. And if I select this this text element and go to data, you can see that the text is linked to the title. And when, when this is in the in the list, it automatically binds the a label to the to the uh, the data data. So now I can already see the the real data here. Uh, maybe we could change this to the headline style and uh, add a grid spacer here. So now we have a grid spacer on bottom of the thing, and maybe we could add a background so add a default background element here and change the color of the background for each list item a bit and uh, it's here we could use this one and now we have a have a list here i i will make sure that this is in the layout flow yes both of these are <coughs> in layout uh, scroll flow group so if the if there's long text, then the item will be just longer, or the height will be expanded. And uh, next thing is the naming. So, like I showed showed here, that the naming of the naming of the elements, it's important. So uh, when you when you have an element here, it's called text. I can just generate the code like this. And uh, this naming here and the screen naming and everything, uh, it it really affects the, how the code is written. So let's see the code. Uh, it's somewhere here. So now we can see that I I named the call uh, the component for the list item to list item one. So this is list item one here. So the 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 name for the for the code file uh, is is the list item one so probably it's better to use proper naming conventions when you are naming data sheets and uh, elements and if we look this in the in the visual studio code you can see that there are there are text elements here text copy and uh, l text so this is something that comes from the on the naming here so i have text and text copy so it, it's the code will be much better and cleaner if you use real names so this would be text title for example you could use label title or whatever you want but i'm, I'm, I'm chasing this just basically click this and then this will be text body like this and if i regenerate the code and Let's see how the code looks now. Here it is. And now we have text title here and we have text body. So it's much more readable. And uh, in the in the, ex, uh, the code, uh, JSX code here, you can see that there's an element text title and then element text body. So the naming makes a huge difference when you are actually when you're working with the code. So that's a, that's a thing, just always when you are naming stuff in the studio, remember that it reflects to the code. That's why you can't have two, two items with the same name. For example, I can't create two, uh, two screens with start name or I can't create data sheet called start because it's already, uh, it's already in, a, in, a, in, a, in the code 
uh, code file, there's already name reserved for that. So you have to use unique naming for, for all the elements in the studio. So that's about naming. And what else do we have here? Yeah, the working with data sheets already uh, showed you the don't export mockup data and then loading loading data from the API. And that's something that we already did the post, but maybe we would like to have a, for example, a uh, element for, uh, I mean, data sheet for, for selected post. So it would show us uh, details for certain posts. So I could create a new sheet called post details like this. And uh, I will just select the, uh, the live data and then this URL path here. This is something that uh, we can tweak. So I'm guessing that the, the JSON placeholder plugin, I'm pretty sure that if you put the post ID, for example, two here, it will show me, yes, it shows me the, just the information just for the post which has the ID two. So we can, I can do it here, just add it here so we get that. But what if we want to have this as a dynamic thing that when user clicks something, we change that ID to something else. So we need to create a data sheet. I'll just go, to, sorry, data slot. So I'm going to data slots, add a add slot. And this is also use proper naming data, DS uh, slot selected post ID and here persistence means that it's uh, it's saved in the in the cache of the of the browser so if you if you uh, close the browser window the the value in the data slot will be still available and then the default value this is something that you usually use in design time in the studio but when you export the app you don't want to have any default value it depends maybe for the active language you want to have a default value but for this case, uh, as I just showed you, I, I used the ID two, but I can add ID three and the comment. This is something that will be just for the, uh, it's just a note for yourself that you can write what, what this da data slot is actually used for selected post ID and the default value is now three. So if I reload this post details, I should Oh, sorry, I need to add the data slot here. So the URL path is something that this will be added to the, the base URL. So I will just select this one and reload data. And now we get the mockup data for the, uh, for the, for this post ID tree, because I had the ID tree in the data slot, but now it's dynamic. So if I change the uh, value in a data slot, it will reload this data sheet automatically uh, with the new post information and I just check this don't export placeholder data for this as well and now we can do it so that because we already have the data in the data sheet I can just re delete the default value and here uh, let's call this screen details details screen and add a navigation bar yes <coughs> and for the for the for the details screen we can add a data source and this data source could be the post details. And uh, in the list item, we need to add a button or hotspot. Uh, we could, uh, let's put it so that I will just add a hotspot here. And when I, when I drag it and use the, uh, click the option key, it will be placed in the foreground group, which means that it's on top of everything. And then I will just make it full width. And, uh, oh, sorry, this is the wrong element. I, I was supposed to add a, not grid spacer, but the hotspot. Where's the hotspot button? It's somewhere here it is. Yeah, do the same thing with op option click. And uh, it's in the foreground group, make it full width, allow stretch, yes. Uh, align it to the bottom and then zero from the top. Now it's full screen, so the whole component is click clickable and that this will be hotspot details screen basically it's just a button and just then just make an interaction and when user taps what we first want to do is basically we want to save some data to the data slot so we want to save the save the 
the selected post ID and uh, and then select the ID here and uh, now we save the the ID of this item here this post item here to the data slot and then after that we can just add a go to interaction and go to details screen and in the project map we have a connection between these two and in the details screens screen we, we can add a bunch of elements let's add a text element I'll just make it 20 pixels from left and minus 20 from right and just duplicate it and uh, this could be the obviously the the title and uh, I need to select the datasheet row because the, that's what is actually uh, because this this uh, detail screen has the data source set for the for the for the screen. So I will just select the data datasheet row here, and let's use the link the title to that one and body to that one, and change the title to the headline style, and I think we're pretty much okay now i can just regenerate the code and uh, now you can see that there's a link every time when i'm hovering the the list element i have a link here and now now let's click this one so the data is loaded here and uh, in the browser developer tools if we check that this is something that uh you should use always for debugging problems and stuff so if we go to sources uh, you can see the code here and you can you can uh, add breakpoints and uh, basically do whatever you want with the debugging the code and the network this shows the stuff for the network so when i'm clicking the uh, when i'm clicking the for example this item here you can see that there's a tree here so it it, it shows me the the API call that we make. This is the API call and the response is shown here. So you can always see that what's what's the problem, why the data is not the API is not sending sending me the right data. You can just check it from the developer console that that what, what was the actual request URL. So this is the base URL we set for the for the JSON, JSON plugin and this tree here is something that we dynamically added to the data slot when you click the whatever button here in the list and now we have 16 so because I clicked the post ID 16 and it, it reloaded the data for the for the uh, details screen and uh, then I think we're good so data slots we already showed show this and setting uh, this element attributes dynamically so you can uh, a bunch of elements they have uh, some attributes that you can set for example visibility uh, for example if I in the list I could add a button here and uh, in the data you can change the target URL uh, dynamically or if it's enabled and uh, you can just link it to if you have a if you already have it in the data, for example, if this button will be enabled, you can just select that property. Or if you if you want to uh, have a script that changes if it's en enabled enabled or not, then you can you can just select the data. Uh, for example, now title we could make a uh, make a uh, script that if the title contains uh, some some character then we disable or enable the button that you can do here so it would as it says here you can if this return the input would be uh, true then the button would be enabled if it's false then it would be disabled so that's what you can do with the with the attributes and there's uh, some of the elements they have a they have the visibility for example, component, you can set if it's visible or not based on the data in a, in a data sheet or data slot or, or a script. And uh, next, let's do check the next one. Yes, using map sections, uh, when you have a big pro, pro, uh, project, for example, I have a speaker prop, uh, project here. 
you can use map sections for making making the uh, the project map cleaner. And uh, for example, I could just uh, select the login and maybe sign up, and just make map section from selected. So no, those two are inside this map section. Now it's just easier to follow uh, which parts and which components belong to each 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 uh, screen and stuff like that. And so I can put this back. Just like this, select, remove, selected from, and back to previous. And now they are back in the in the main level of the of the project map. And in the project map view, you can this is the other way of checking the checking the uh, screens and and components. But uh, the map sections they are pretty 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 nice. I mean, it just makes sense if you have hundreds of uh, elements, components, and screens on your on your design, it map sections make your life a lot, lot easier. It's just select whatever you want from here and just create a sort of folder of the selection. And uh, that's about it. Uh, and then debugging the code, I already showed you that just use the browser tools for, for debugging the code. Sometimes it's uh, it's just makes it much easier. You can see, check the, uh, for example, check if the data slot really gets the value, if there's a, if there's a, if you have used some weird character that breaks the code, you can see it immediately here. The console usually tells you pretty much everything you need to know. And at least versus script, uh, list grid scrolling in foreground versus scroll flow. This is something that uh, in some cases, in rare, rare, rare cases, you could have a, you would have a list and you want, I will just delete this button by the way here. I, we don't need that. So this, basically this list, as you can see here, it just makes the screen longer. But what if you have a, uh, some sort of design that you want to have the list so that it scrolls inside the element? I can simply just drag it to the foreground group here and uh, just make it, make it shorter now because there was like 20, 20 elements here, let's see if I can change it like this. Another button here. Like this, I will just make this list much Usually you don't, it's better to if you don't have like 20 rows in the data sheet because it makes the design design phase much, much more. <laughs> it just makes it trickier. So I'll, I will just delete the stuff because in real life we just need a couple of the rows at, when we're designing in the studio. So now it's much, much more shorter like this. And uh, I will make put this button here and now the list should actually scroll in its container like this. So that's how you can make the list scroll inside the container. This is a rare case. Usually this is a bad practice for any any web uh, web page but it's it's possible to do it that way. That was just a sort of a sort of a tip for that. And then what's the difference between list and grid? Uh, well, obviously grid is a grid, so you can just select the grid uh, list element here. I will just change the layout so that it's you know it's full width. And uh, then make it so that for example, for a wide phone or a narrow tablet or bigger screen size, it will be a grid or it's a horizontal uh, horizontally scrolling list. So I will just select grid for the wider screen sizes and perhaps for the the widest one we could have a four columns and for a narrow it will be two columns and for the mobile phone size it will be a list and uh, just regenerate the code and now we should 
we should have a grid and in the mobile size we have a list it changes to now we have two columns when i make the screen bigger now we have four four columns for the for the for the grid and uh, that's pretty easy and uh, you can tweak the, the settings here uh, if you want to have more spacing between each elements i can just change it to for example 20 vertical and horizontal and just regenerate the code and uh, now we have more spacing between each of the of the elements in the grid and in the list okay uh, list versus grid we already did it and then the columns element this is uh, for the making the layout for for mobile and uh, for mobile and uh, and perhaps uh, wider sizes so I'll just generate new screen columns demo and uh, I could start it so that I will just place the responsive columns element here and uh, I'll make it full width like this and this is just a placeholder it doesn't do anything it's a container in the settings you can see how many columns we have and uh, how the columns work when there's a different different uh, screen size so by default it's two columns for everything but we can change it so that uh, for example a phone all the columns they will be on top of each other but in a narrow uh, i mean wider sizes they are side by side and then what's the what's the width of the column for for the first column so i'll i'll select so that the left side in the bigger screens will be 30 percent and then we have to select which components are nested here and i will just uh, drag the couple of components here which i've already created and there's a menu so this doesn't make any these are not does, doesn't make like any sense these components they're just examples and head to the back to the columns element it says that i i, I haven't set any of these here but let's put it so that first column will have the menu and the second column it has the contact us um, component here and you can already see that this is how it works in a smaller sizes it will be uh, they will be on top of each other and in the wider sizes they will be side by side because we are using the columns container and we don't have a link to the columns demo so i need to add a button here let's add a button to the here and add an interaction go to columns demo regenerate the code now when i click this i head here so when I change the size of the uh, of the browser, you can see that these two components they are placed on top of each other or side by side. And you can have uh, I think that three columns is the maximum we have now. Uh, not sorry, this is the wrong wrong one. Yes, you can have three columns maximum, but you can nest this so that so that the col the component inside the column can have a com uh, column inside but usually you don't need to do that kind of stuff usually the three columns is enough so that's about it uh, i think we already we went through all the, the basic stuff just remember name your stuff correctly uh, just learn how to debug the code and uh, because the react studio is just it, it's a code generation tool so we're not babysitting that much uh, of what the user can do so you can do you can create scripts that doesn't work you can create lots of stuff that doesn't work when you generate the code yeah, and so then you have to just check that what's the problem and maybe the data slot is empty or 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 the api doesn't respond or something like that so you have to you have to check that in the browser just like doing the normal development it's the basically the same stuff we are generating code and you need to debug the code so that's about it uh, that's uh, that's the this is the the basics basics and uh, sort of a cheat sheet for 
getting started with React Studio and uh, how to actually actually learn to debug your projects and uh, maybe the best practices for the basic stuff. Thank you for watching and uh, see you in the next video.